something like 2,700-ish years ago. That's thousands of years after the events it's supposed to be recorded accurately, literally, perfectly. I personally don't trust something that's, that's uh, recorded by oral history for 2,000 years. There is zero archaeological proof to back up any of this. Like zero, not a scrap. The, uh, the missing Pharaoh's army, the Jewish conquest of the Holy Land, and on and on. It's just not there. Um, this is my, one of my personal beefs. It's hard to believe people who can't get their story straight. There's 33,000 Christian denominations and more to come, like daily by one scholar's estimate. There's 149 translations of the Bible in English. You, talk, you heard Mr. Peachy talk about how crucial translation is. You shouldn't have to translate the account 149 times to get to the literal truth. This is one of the ones that, I mean, this is, uh, this example here is, it's just goofy, right? So the Chinese are, are currently in the year 4714. So if Genesis is literally accurate, then the Chinese civilization was obliterated in their year 1420. One of Noah's family got off the boat, made his or her way back to China, found the old calendar, and started counting it. It, it, it stretches credulity, right? I mean, it's just hard to take. So I say, this is the question. How can anyone believe this? Well, I think, as Mr. Peachy said several times, it's by faith. Who do you have faith in? What do you have faith in? And by the way, these have zero faith in science. I hope I can explain that later this evening. But Paul the Apostle tells us it's all about faith. It's faith in things that you hope are true. It's faith that gives you conviction that's not um, backed up by your physical senses. Faith in things that you hope are true. Ken Ham, some of you will know his work very well, uh, is on record several places. If he uh, makes it in, in his uh, debate with Bill Nye, he makes a very pointed uh, comment about the fact that it really doesn't matter what fallible man says, I've got a book, and that's all I need. And that's faith. Please hear me, I'm not saying anything against faith. I'm just saying the only way you can take this stuff is by faith. I'm a skeptic, among other things, and I want some evidence. I want unbiased observations, I want some empirical findings, I want some test results, and of course the sine qua non of any kind of intellectual pursuit <coughs> is data. Okay, so instead of faith, skeptics trust in science. And this is a crucial distinction for me and I just want to try to make it clear. I trust in science because it consistently gives us knowledge about what is really real. It talks and tells us about the nature of nature. This machine works because we understand some of the principles of science. We flew here because we understand the principles of science. This is the kind of stuff that we put our trust in. But it takes faith to believe in what the to believe in the literal case of it, that Genesis is literally true. I trust science, I have faith in yours. I hope that my team comes back to life someday, but I sure have zero evidence that they're going to. But I still have faith in them. I do not trust them. So a couple of, um, a couple of examples, right? I'm trying to illustrate for you what, in my mind, is the difference here. The difference between faith in the Bible and trust in science. 
So the Bible, the Genesis written by an anonymous reporter who wasn't there, gives us literally, literally true historical facts, such as uh, there was a day and there was a night on day two. Day two, God created day and night, but God didn't make the sun until day four. That has to be taken by faith. Uh, science tells us a very different story. All of these um, findings uh, incontrovertibly tell us that the earth is ancient, um, that we're here because of natural selection. And you have to have the sun before you can have the night. This one is a little cheeky, I admit, but it sticks in my craw that the almighty creator, universe, creator God of the universe tells us he'll give us our wishes and yet has yet to heal one amputee. Science gives us trustworthy knowledge like these kinds of things. It tells us that uh, Down's child is suffering from a chromosomal disorder, not because of unconfessed sin of the pants. Uh, people who do strange things are schizophrenic and not possessed by demons. Leprosy requires antibiotics, not the cleansing rituals we find in the Old Testament. The sun, not the earth, is the center of the solar system. We breathe, not because God wills it, because of oxygen. So this is, I think, where Mr. Pucci might be misunderstanding science, and I hope we get a chance to talk about this later. Science is intentionally, is by design, self-correcting. What uh, somebody just thought of last week, last month, last year, last decade, is refined, as instruments get better, it's improved, as more data is collected, it's changed. <coughs> That's what science does. It's not a, science proves nothing. It proves nothing. It just gives us probabilities. And probabilities like the, fl the plane is probably going to fly. Science, can, this is crucial. Science talks about nature as the finer, final arbiter. And this is where I want to go next. So I want to talk about positive evidence. Positive for something. Evidence for something. Okay. So here's a long list of positive evidence that the earth is ancient and by extrapolation Genesis is not literally true. So we have radiometric dating, and we have ice cores. Radiometrics tell us uh, that some, some rocks are billions of years old. Um, ice cores tell us that some uh, glaciers are as much as 160,000 years old. The, uh, the science of um, studying varves. So varves are sediments that you find on the bottom of large lakes. And uh, you can count the years. It's like counting the trees on a, a ring on a tree. Uh, there's a lake in Japan, Lake Sui Getsu, I mean, if I'm not butchering that too much, that has 60,000 years recorded in var deposits. Dendrochronology, uh, that's tree rings and clonal trees, goes back, I think uh, the number is 80,000. Each one of these, young earth creationists will say, yeah, but I can show you one time, or a handful of times, when the findings were overturned. Yeah, but the scientists are part of a conspiracy to fool us. Yeah, but if this is true, then human dignity is diminished. Yeah, but the rate of decay or the speed of light was different in the past. Well, yeah, buts are not positive evidence. Yeah, buts are not positive evidence. And if you go through Yuck literature, you'll see that the hallmarks of science are missing. Data, peer review, and dealing with the existing mountain of literature. Pick anything, anything you want to investigate. Somebody has already written the, uh, and some people have already written a mountain on this issue. 
And you have to deal with the existing literature. The X don't. So, does evolution hold water? Well, for me it does, because it's loaded with data. It's a wash in data. I had to read a scientific paper sometime, and if you're like me, you know, it'll start to grow a tumor. Um, carefully controlled methods. This is what's missing. This is what's missing in a lot of stuff that I've tried to read for tonight's debate. Uh, Mr. Peachy suggested Sarfield and others. And I, I just keep looking for the method where they're ruling out their own prejudices and their own biases, and it's just not there. Yeah, I'm going to have to take my word for it, I guess, unless you've been there. If you've taken a master's degree or a PhD, I'm going to tell you, it is extremely, extremely competitive. Like, it's running through the gauntlet to get yourself published. And I'm just going to move on because I'm running out of time. Here's some of the things that YEX could do. So these are some of the things that I, I this, if, if some of this happened, I, would have to take a really hard look and ask myself some serious questions. But do some of these things. Find the ark. Find the marsupials that are supposed to have gone from Mount Ararat to Australia. Find the genetic evidence that humans came from the Near East, North Africa. Actually define what they mean by kinds, and then somehow or other explain how the nebulous cat kind turned into all the cats and felines that we can imagine today, the lions, the tigers, and on and on, all in 4,000 years, and my time is up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. And uh, we will now move into the rebuttal stage. I'm very pleased with uh, the way you're talking up with your time and uh, allowing yourselves 20 minutes to, uh, to breathe your your subject matter. At this point, we want to encourage you again to write the questions, which will be collected in about 10 minutes. And uh, allow Mr. Lewis to get set for his rebuttal. You have five minutes. Yeah, we're back to eight. You're up first. Ready? Check, check, can you have you feel a little check cheeky of me to use my rebuttal time to finish my presentation with it? Well, I, the only thing I, I wanted to say is, I think I've said it. My beef is, show me the evidence. Positive evidence, not arguments against, not yeah, but, not what about this exception or that exception, but deal with the fact that every known science is wrong in every way if Genesis is literally true. Okay, so just a couple of thoughts on, on Mr. Peachy's excellent presentation. I think he's making the mistake that most creationists in general and therefore young creationists make by equating my statement, evolution explains why we're sitting here tonight, looking the way we do, um, with atheism, communism, uh, nihilism. What Mr. Peachy does is say, I don't like the results of, of science. I don't like that it seems to diminish human dignity which isn't true, by the way, and that's a whole different discussion. Hopefully that'll happen another night. But it's, it's comparing apples and oranges. I am saying I got a mountain of evidence to show you that this is the case, and Mr. Peachy is saying, in effect, yeah, but it means that we tell kids things like they're here because of a uh, kind of a in because of God, sorry, I'm struggling. Because God, God wasn't involved, and that's just it. And, and that's not the case. That's not what we're trying to say. Um, the other thing that struck struck me as Mr. Peachy's um, presentation was his argument that the Genesis is literally true because the Bible says it is. 
if you did that same kind of logic and applied it to the Quran, I'm going to tell you, the Quran says it's true. And Buddhist writings and Hindu writings say they're true. There's, there's no convincing, corroborating evidence in the statement. Genesis is literally true because Jesus said it was. Maybe I'll just close with pointing out. There's a big difference between science populizers and science scientific findings. So Dawkins is a brilliant science populizer. But if he changes his mind or if he misstates in some way, that says nothing against the bedrock findings of any number of scientific study. Right? So it, again, it's a, it's, a, it's a mismatch of, of mutually exclusive claims. And I think that's it. You're right. I appreciate you, Mr. Lewis, has presented a vast array of arguments and uh, objections to the creation account and to the Bible in general. And obviously, I'm not going to be able to respond to each and every one of those, but I will be selective. But I appreciate that he's uh, done some homework and, and shown all these potential objections. And now, each one of us who uh, takes a different view and in fact, those who take the same view um, may want to wrestle with some of those and, and look at all of them from different points of view. And I can, I can think of uh, immediate responses to some of them. Uh, others, I'd have to go and do some research. But there, there are answers to many of them, maybe not all, but then every worldview has its problems and issues that are unresolved so far. I do pre appreciate that uh, uh, he's expressed agreement that Genesis is not, is not intended to be taken as symbolic. So at least we're united on uh, one or more points uh, of that nature. It's not metaphorical. It is intended to be taken as literal and historical. So those who wish to compromise it by trying to inject millions of years into it are uh, going against the positions of both of us, it seems. Now, uh, toward the end there, um, Mr. Lewis talked about evolution being uh, trustworthy and evolution does hold water. So I'm going to have a look at that and I'm going to be referring again to his letter from the Lacombe Globe. Uh, Mr. Lewis asserted that in that letter that evolution is a established scientific fact and that we accurately understand the origin and development of all life. That would be news to John Horgan, former senior science editor of Scientific American. Just a few years ago, Horgan wrote an item titled, Psst, don't tell the creationists, but scientists don't have a clue how life began. So actually, we don't really understand it. Similarly, biologist Massimo Piliucci, writing in Skeptical Inquirer magazine, recounted Stanley Miller's classic origin of life chemistry experiments. Then he commented, unfortunately, such experiments have not progressed much further than their original prototype, leaving us with a sour aftertaste from the primordial soup. What about my opponent's claim that we accurately understand the development of all life? Well, that would be news to Cambridge paleontologist Simon Conway Morris, 
who wrote in the prestigious journal Cell, when discussing organic evolution, the only point of agreement seems to be it happened. Thereafter, there is little consensus. Constructing phylogenies, or evolutionary histories, is central to the evolutionary enterprise, yet rival schemes are often strongly contradictory. Can we really recover the true history of life? In his letter, Mr. Lewis made reference to science-based emergency rooms, as if somehow Darwin should get the credit for such facilities. But in 2008, biology professor Peter Armbruster noted, evolution receives scant attention on the U.S. Medical College admission test, the MCAT, and almost no coverage in medical school curricula. One of the central arguments of those who promote evolutionary medicine has always been that evolutionary concepts should be emphasized in the education of clinicians. Unfortunately, this proposition has not been well received by medical schools thus far, probably in part because <coughs> evolutionary insights have led to relatively few clinical applications. Mr. Mr. Lewis concluded his letter to the editor with this, there's probably no God, now stop worrying and enjoy your life. You may recall that's a slogan used by atheists in an advertising campaign some time ago. But the Bible teaches there is a God, we are accountable to him, we should start worrying, then we should repent and come to the Savior foretold in Genesis chapter 3. Having done that, we can truly start enjoying life. Jesus said, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Thank you. Thank you, Richie. And uh, you'll be up to the counter rebuttal here in a few uh, seconds. Uh, right now, we want to ask those uh, who are given the privilege to collect questions to collect them now. They should be uh, already written. And we've got a couple of blue tubs that are going to be flying down the, the lane, says as our debaters get uh, ready for, for the final round. And then we'll have two questions selected for both sides. And uh, remember that there are two pages that you should have noted. One, a question for Mr. Peachy, and one, a question for Mr. I appreciate a healthy debate and uh, also appreciate that you guys are appreciating each other. So as we continue, ask Mr. Peachy to come forward for the common rebuttal. Miracles. Right. 
But there's more. The Big Bang supposedly forms particles of both matter and antimatter. And these entities are, should be in exact balance because they start from nothing. But no, the claim is that somehow there was this slight excess of matter over antimatter. So that when all the particles finish annihilating each other, what we're left with is just some regular matter from which the whole present universe has been formed. To quote Nobel laureate Steven Weinberg, it is this early excess of matter over antimatter, estimated as one part in 10 billion, that survived, which determined the future development of the universe. In other words, if you accept the current secular origin story, the Big Bang, you must believe that a tiny point in primordial space-time contained not just one universe, but enough potential for 10 billion universes. Indeed, many secular cosmologists and physicists are now seriously suggesting that such an event could have occurred not just once, but repeatedly, up to 10 to the power of 500 times. And of course, this proposed multiverse is currently unobserved and will probably be forever unobservable, but never mind, keep the faith. The next thing, if you accept atheistic, naturalistic thinking, is you have to agree that life can magically appear from non-life. So, for no good reason, biomonomers, such as amino acids, nucleotides, and sugars, join themselves together into long, exclusive polymers, very much contrary to their natural inclination. And for no good reason, these long polymers turn out to be homochiral, the randomly assembled proteins contain nothing but left-handed amino acids. And the chaotically formed nucleic acids have only right-handed sugars. And then for no good reason, those unlikely polymers eventually collect themselves together into even more unlikely self-replicating entities. So somehow, a series of random chemical accidents is able to accomplish far beyond what any well-staffed, well-funded 21st century laboratory can deliberately make happen with all their purified reactants and idealized reaction conditions. Next thing, if you accept evolutionary thinking, is that you believe that amphibians can turn into humans, frogs into princes, if you please, given enough of that magical pixie dust called time. Increasing complexity appears magically through processes that in real life are recognized as negative, destructive, and harmful. Processes like mutations, accidental errors in genetic coding, and natural selection, or the untimely deaths of lots of organisms. Creationists at least can point to a supernatural agent who has the ability to make supernatural events occur, but evolutionists require unthinking matter and energy to perform magic all on their own, contrary to all their observed tendencies and abilities. I do not have enough faith to believe in that kind of magic. Thank you. You recognize to have Can I have just like 20 seconds here?
problems that he might find in the yabats of science, but he offers no positive evidence for his position. So I'm just going to finish off by, by saying, tonight's debate is not really about whether evolution or genesis, the genesis story is literally true. The evidence is in, and ev evolution is an established scientific fact. The real issue is whether young earth creationists like what they think are the ramifications of evolution. This is a very different conversation. Your tires may save your life when driving on ice because they're designed to increase traction using the scientifically studied and established law of friction. Friction is real, friction happens. When your tires lose traction, it is because there's not enough friction. The outcome has nothing to do with whether you like it or not. Similarly, evolution is real. Evolution happens regardless of whether or not young earth creationists like it. Oops, wrong way. What am I doing here? Okay. My closing thought would be this. Modern life is challenging and confusing. I don't think anybody in this room is going to disagree with me, with me on that. The speed of change in the 21st century is dizzying. The key to our shared future is preparing our children to think clearly, rationally, and accurately. They must learn how to be critical consumers of information. They must have a steadfast commitment to what is really real. Teaching our kids that the book of Genesis is literally true does nothing to give our kids these skills. In fact, it promotes a parochial us versus them mentality that encourages a life built on faith over reason. In summation, I submit that Genesis is not really literally true and that it is wrong to teach kids something that is not true. Thank you, Mr. Peachy. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for the questions. Thank you, Mr. Lewis and Mr. Peachy. Uh, it's an opportunity to ask some uh, questions from the audience. Appreciate your patience. We're right on schedule. We'll take, we'll take 15 minutes for this last session before we say thank you and then have opportunities for us to mingle and have some beverages and snacks and opportunity to, to ask and, and hear a little bit more as Mr. Lewis and Mr. Peachy have, have agreed to stay and, and hang around. So. Uh, what we'll do with this piece of format is um, I'll just draw a question at random uh, out of the bowl, and then we will read that to the person that it's addressed to. And then you have two minutes if the question is addressed to you, and one minute to respond. And likewise, if the question is addressed to you, then you can respond. So just, uh, and we'll have two for each of you. So this bowl says one question for uh, Scott Lewis, uh, uh, Mr. Lewis. Uh, two minutes to answer this. You say you're a trust in science. You trust in science. Then say science doesn't prove anything. It is only probabilities. Nor did you give data or evidence of evolution. Can you clear up your contradictions? This is the question of just you. Two minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent question. Yes. Um, yeah, and it, th this question goes right to the heart of the matter, so thank you to whoever wrote it. I, and I didn't probably do a very good job of what I will distinguish between trust and faith. Trust in the scientific findings, not in science, in scientific findings, is the kind of trust uh, I talked about in that earlier letter. If, if your loved one is hit by a car, I hope the first thing you do is rush to the ER. Go ahead and pray on the way. But I think everyone in this room knows that prayer is not enough. I think everyone in this room would agree with me that the science behind modern medicine, the science behind the well-established findings is trustworthy. And so I think what the confusion I may have engendered is that um, the long list of positive evidence that I gave to you is what I offer in, in trusting. Um, and I have no faith in faith. Thank you very much. Just leave the mic on, please. And uh, one minute to, uh, to counter. Mr. Beachy? 
Thank you. Okay, in terms of uh, different sorts of science, I just want to comment on uh, the link that Mr. Lewis drew between friction and then evolution. These are two different types of, I'm not going to object to them both being called science because what is and what isn't science, that demarcation line is very hard to find. But there are two different kinds of science. To study friction in the laboratory, it's a branch of physics called tribology, as in tribulation. That's the study of physics. You can measure it, you can do experiments on it in the laboratory, you can figure out all kinds of things, and they uh, look the same in experiment after experiment. Evolution is not like that. Evolution is a lot of hypothesizing that gets revised with one new discovery. It gets changed because some maverick scientist says, I, I don't agree with that, I want to make a name for myself. I'll come up with a different theory, and all the theories hold about the same amount of water, which is not necessarily a lot. It's a historical reconstructions based on a long chain of inferences and assumptions, many of them often questionable, not just questionable by creationists, questionable by each other within the uh, evolutionary field. Thank you. And as we have ordered our program, then we will have, uh, you, get, you get two minutes there. Just a random poll for a question for Mr. Peachy. If you are only good because of God, then you are a psychopath on a leash. Comment. And then underneath it says, who was Cain's wife and where did she come from? So. They snuck in two questions. I don't know if that means we give you four minutes, but we're going to stick with the two, then you have one minute to counter. Let me be very blunt. Cain's wife would have been a sister or possibly a niece. Now, that sounds like incest when we think of that today, but in the early days, if Adam and Eve were the first parents, there would have been no other possibility, and the genetic uh, erosion or entropy had not taken place at that early time, so the, the genetic problems encountered by such uh, questionable marriages today would not be there. But that's, that's the straightforward answer. If you're only good because of God, then you're a psychopath. Well, uh, I often think that maybe I would be a sociopath or something on, on like a leash. that. On a leash. On a leash. On a leash. <laughs> on a leash. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I, I know that I, I am a sinner. I do need restraint. The Holy Spirit restrains me. And God holds me back, and all of us back, I would suggest, from a lot of evil things that we might accomplish. I mean, the people in Germany in the 1940s, were they different people from us? Or were they just uh, people who the circumstances led in a certain direction and maybe they should have resisted. Maybe we think we would have, maybe we wouldn't though. We're, we're all uh, beings who have this uh, questionable moral nature which easily falls into uh, evil and is ready to harm others unless we restrain ourselves or have some other kind of leash on us. Um, if you're only good because of God, no, I wouldn't say that people are only doing good things because they are Christians. Uh, atheists, atheists often have fine uh, moral sensibilities, but they don't have a good ultimate reason for ethical behavior. Thank you, Mr. Peachy. Mr. Lewis, one minute. Mm -hmm. One minute to talk about the meaning of life and all that good stuff. Yeah. Well, I think I'll just very briefly say that this question and Mr. Peachy's answer underlines my argument. The muddying of the waters with the findings of science and what may be the moral implications, it's two different things. Uh, another night I'd be happy to talk about the morality of the atheist stance, but tonight I, want, I think it's crucial that we don't let a moral question in the back door and somehow think that that um, disqualifies a mountain of established scientific findings. Thank you very much. All right, you got your uh, crack at it, one 
each one more. Do not answer it. <laughs> How do you explain all of laws of the universe spontaneously manifesting in the Big Bang? That's in quotes. So, how do you explain all of the laws of the universe spontaneously manifesting in the Big Bang? Two minutes. I don't. I have no idea. I don't. <laughs> but it's not connected to whether I wish Just a couple of good comments, then uh, I would disagree. I would say it is connected with whether evolution is true because it's an evolutionary worldview starting with cosmic evolution and then chemical evolution or the origin of life and then biological evolution or the origin of the biodiversity that we have and then cultural evolution. It's all tied into one big evolutionary worldview. And the academics themselves use evolution, that word, for all of those things. But I'd like to agree with the last thing that we said before that, and that moral issues and issues of empirical science uh, do need to be distinguished. I think distinguished is why I agree with that. Thank you very much. And the last question for you, Mr. Ricci. I feel like a providential 50 50 dry. <laughs> Give me one like the last one. Okay. Question for Mr. Peachy. Okay, so. How can you possibly claim that the writing style of Genesis proves that it is... Oh boy. Factually correct. Okay, fine. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. Uh, most of Shakespeare's plays are written in prose, including uh, the tragedies and the comedies, although, although they're not true. Two minutes. I'm not an expert in Shakespeare. That question should go to you. Did he not write a lot of stuff in iambic pentameter? Uh, that's a kind of a poetic form. Uh, in any case, just about Genesis, it's, the writing style is indicative of prose rather than poetry. A lot of uh, people sometimes uh, try to use the argument that Genesis is poetry, therefore we don't have to take it seriously. So what I'm trying to do is dispose of that argument by showing you that there are uh, significant prose markers within the text. So the writing style indicates that it's prose and that it's intended to be taken as history. And there are other arguments about that besides the style. It's the genealogies, etc., that I discussed before. It's intended to be taken as history. That's all that shows. Now, whether it really is true history is a separate case, and I've tried to make that um, case on the using different arguments, including the authority of the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, whose teaching, he said, is from God. One minute. Okay. Um, okay. I think I'll just refer to an earlier slide where I was talking about 141 English Bibles and 33,000 denominations and so on. Um, what language did God speak to the anonymous reporter of Genesis? I don't know. I, I don't think anyone knows. We do know that Genesis and the Bible was written in Aramaic, was written in Hebrew, and you need to know some Latin, a lot of Latin, a lot of Greek. Trying to read Shakespeare now is difficult. It's a challenge to understand Shakespeare in 2018. Try to understand whatever the ancient languages were is a little bit like trying to understand old English. It's incomprehensible except to the expert. And I just doubt that God communicated in such a roundabout way. Thank you very much, Mr. Lewis. So those are our two questions that wrap up, and I know there's uh, quite a few more in there, but we are going to end the evening 
on that note as far as our presenters go. I want to close uh, by inviting you for some snacks and uh, coffee and to engage more with Mr. P.G. Wellington and uh, Mr. Lewis. I, I want to first just take a second to say this is a great showing, a great crowd from both sides tonight. And I want to really appreciate the, uh, the way we've honored them tonight with uh, your presence. But more so, I understand too that since uh, there's, there's people on, on both ends, there's, there's emotions right here. And uh, I'm just thankful that uh, we could uh, be here together and, uh, and be in each other's presence, even though those emotions are very real to us, regardless of who you are. So I want to say that in a way of saying thank you to all of you who, who Mr. Peachy and Mr. Uh, Lewis came here for. It's, it's for you. I would also like to say uh, thank you to Mr. Lewis and Mr. Peachy and um, and say this, that as a guy who speaks in public in various ways, uh, that uh, uh, vulnerability is, is at stake. And we often know that whenever we've had an opportunity to public speak, uh, we sometimes deny it because we fear of criticism and so on. And so for them to be here today is a, a pure joy and a gift for us to, to see and hear that they make themselves available. So as we close up, we just stand up and just give them a round of applause.